Welcome to Remote Learning. For this lesson, we'll look at the next two scenes of the play, Act 1, Scene 2 and Act 1, Scene 3. For this lesson, all you'll need is a piece of pen and paper or a Word document open, and of course, your brain. So what are we doing today? So today we're going to look closely at the next two scenes of Macbeth and think about how language is used in them. Then we'll think about the design and logistics of a stage. So why are we learning this? Well, these scenes, especially Act 1, Scene 3, is vital to the plot of Macbeth because this is the scene where Macbeth encounters the witches and as you know, they fuel the tragedy element of the play. So how does this fit into our learning journey? Well, last lesson we looked at the opening scene of Macbeth and analysed it. This is our seventh lesson of Macbeth where we'll analyse Act 1, Scene 2 and 3. And next lesson, guys, We'll look at Act 1, Scene 4 with Duncan and Macbeth. Okay guys, so our learning objective today is to translate Shakespearean language and analyse its use in Act 1, Scene 2 and 3. Then we'll apply this knowledge to the design of a stage for Macbeth. So first of all, I'm going to give you a start task to think about how meaning is conveyed through paradoxes. Then second, we'll look at Shakespearean language and his tendency to omit letters and replace them with apostrophes. Then for the student led portion of the lesson, I'll play you performances of Act 1, Scene 2 and 3, then analyse the select passages and translate them. And for the student led part guys, I'm going to send you away to complete a task that will secure your knowledge of today's learning. So guys, to begin with, I want you to look at these four paradoxes and for each, write down what they could be suggesting or implying. So for example, the first one, when the battle's lost and won, this could imply that although there could be a victory, there is a loss too. So this could be loss of life, title, or an object. Can you pause the video here, guys, and unpause when you are ready? So guys, Shakespearean language can be difficult to understand and say, but many of the words Shakespeare uses we still use today. So Shakespeare frequently uses the apostrophe for an omission, to reduce the amount of syllables in a line, which resembled spoken language at that time. So let's go through some examples. So tis means it is, over, over, so the V, okay, missing the V. So ne near, so never, ever means ever. Ian means even. And at, so you're missing out the A. Then we have the was which means it was then we which means with and t means to okay so guys on the board i have three quotations from macbeth and all i want you to do is translate them into modern english so some are more simple than others but let's see how you do so the first we have if it were done when it is done then twere well it were done quickly and then we have and let the angel whom thou still have served tell thee. And lastly, we have that will be ere the set of sun. Okay, so please pause the video here and unpause when you are ready. Okay, guys, let's go through some answers. So the first one is if this would be really be finished when I did it, then it would be best to get it over with quickly. Then the next one is and let the angel who you still serve tell you. And the last one is that will happen before sunset. Okay guys, now we're going to listen to Act 1, Scene 2 of Macbeth. So as you listen, think about what honours Duncan wishes to bestow on Macbeth, how Macbeth is described by the captain, and what the audience expectations of the character of Macbeth is. Act 1, Scene 2, A Camp Near Fores. Alarm within. Enter King Duncan, Malcolm, Donalbane, Lennox, with attendants, meeting a bleeding captain. What bloody man is that, he can report, as seemeth by his flight of the revolt the new estate. This is the sergeant, who like a good and hardy soldier fought against my captivity. Hail, best friend, say to the king the knowledge of the broil, as thou didst leave it. Doubtful it stood as two spent swimmers that do cling together and choke their art. The merciless MacDonald, worthy to be a rebel, 
For to that the multiplying villainies of nature do swarm upon him, from the western isles of Kearns and gallow glasses is supplied, and fortune on his damned quarrel smiling showed like a rebel's whore, but all's too weak for brave Macbeth. Well, he deserves that name disdaining fortune with this brandished steel which smoked with bloody execution, like Valor's minion carved out his passage till he faced the slave, which ne'er shook hands nor bade farewell to him, till he unseamed him from the knave to the chaps and fixed his head upon our battlements. O oh, valiant cousin, worthy gentleman, as whence the sun gins his reflection, shipwrecking storms and direful thunders break, so from that spring whence comfort seemed to come, comfort swells. Mark, King of Scotland, Mark, no sooner justice had with valour armed compelled these skipping kerns to trust their heels. But the Norwegian lord surveying vantage, with furbished arms and new supplies of men, began a fresh assault. Dismayed not this our captains, Macbeth and Banquo? Yes, as sparrows, eagles, or the hare, the lion. If I say soothe, I must report they were as cannons overcharged with double cracks, so they doubly redoubled strokes upon the foe, except they meant to bathe in reeking wounds, or memorise another Golgotha, I cannot tell. But I am faint, my gashes cry for help. So well thy words become thee as thy wounds, they smack of honour both. Go, get him, surgeons. Exit captain with attendants. Enter Ross and Angus. Who comes here? The worthy fane of Ross. What a haste looks through his eyes. So should he look that seems to speak things strange. God save the king. Whence comest thou, worthy vane? From Fife, great king. The Norwegian banners flout the sky and fan our people cold. Norway himself, with terrible numbers, assisted by the most disloyal traitor, the Thane of Cawdor, began a dismal conflict to that Bologna's bridegroom, lapped in proof, confronted him with self-comparisons, point against point, rebellious arm against arm, curbing his lavish spirit, and to conclude, the victory fell on us. Great happiness. But now, Sweeno, the Norway's king craves composition, nor would he deign him burial of his men, till he disperse St. Cole's inch, ten thousand dollars to our general use. No more that Thane of Cordor shall deceive our bosom interest. Go pronounce his present death, and with his former title, greet Macbeth. I'll see it done. What he hath lost, noble Macbeth hath won. Excellent. So let's analyse some key lines in this speech. So in the first line, for brave Macbeth, well he deserves that name, here the captain uses the title Brave Macbeth, which shows how much respect this character has for his deeds in battle. Here Shakespeare intends for us to understand that Macbeth is a good and noble character who the audience suspect will be corrupted by the witches from Act 1, Scene 1. So let's look at line 2, so disdaining fortune with his brandished steel. So here it describes Macbeth's disdaining fortune, which is laughing in disregard of his own safety, but also employing a prowess or skill with a sword. This shows his bravery and fearless nature. So next we have the line unseen him from the knave to the chops. Like I've mentioned before in a previous lesson, this is quite a graphic description, essentially explaining how Macbeth chopped Macdonald in half from the navel, which is the belly, to the chops, which meaning the cheeks. So this demonstrates how physically powerful Macbeth is and how ruthless he is. So notice also that killing in this context is portrayed as a noble trait or a good thing for a man to have. Okay guys, and lastly we have the line and fixed his head upon the battlements. So here Mac Macbeth has actually fixed Macdonald's head to the battlements, which is at the top of the castle wall. So this symbolizes his power and warns everyone else what will happen to people if they rebel against the king. So this shows Macbeth's loyalty to the king as he has defeated the king's enemies and deterred others from waging wars against him. So here guys we'll look at a modern translation for the captain's lines. So please be aware that there are many interpretations and there's not just one definitive translation. But this particular translation is from the website called No Fear Shakespeare. So Brave Macbeth laughing at luck 
chopped his way through to MacDonald, who didn't even have time to say goodbye or shake hands before Macbeth split him open from the navel to the jawbone and stuck his head on the battle walls. So now we're going to listen to Act 1, Scene 3 of Macbeth. And this scene is where Macbeth first encounters the witches. So notice how Macbeth first appears in a scene with the witches. And this is important to the audience's perception of this character. So as you listen, think about how the witches change when in the presence of Macbeth. The differences between Banquo's and Macbeth's reaction. And how Macbeth reacts when a prediction comes true. Act 1 Scene 3 Thunder Enter three witches <laughs> Where hast thou been, sister? Killing swine Sister, where art thou? A sailor's wife had chestnuts in her lap And munched and munched and munched Give me, quoth I, a roint thee, witch The rump-fed Ronion cries Her husband's to Aleppo gone, master of the tiger But in sieve I'll thither sail And like a rat without a tail I'll do, I'll do, and I'll do I'll give thee a wind Thou art kind And I another I myself have all the other, and the very ports they blow, all the quarters that they know in the shipman's card. I will drain him dry as hay. Sleep shall neither night nor day hang upon his penthouse lid. He shall live a man forbid. Weary sere nights, nine times nine, shall he dwindle, peak and pine, though his bark cannot be lost, yet it shall be tempest-tossed. Look what I have. Show me, show me. Here I have a pilot's thumb, wrecked as homeward he did come. Drum within. A drum, a drum, Macbeth doth come. The weird sisters hand in hand, posters of the sea and land, thus do go about, about. Thrice to thine and thrice to mine And thrice again to make up nine Peace the charms wound up Enter Macbeth and Banquo So foul and fair a day I have not seen How far is called to Forres? What are these so withered and so wild in their attire That look not like the inhabitants of the earth And yet are on it Live you? Or are you aught that man may question? You seem to understand me. By each at once her choppy finger laying upon her skinny lips. You should be women, and yet your beards forbid me to interpret that you are so. Speak, if you can. What are you? All hail, Macbeth. Hail to thee, Thane of Glamis. All hail, Macbeth. Hail to thee, Thane of Cawdor. All hail, Macbeth. Thou shalt be king hereafter. Good sir. Why do you start and seem to fear things that do sound so fair? I, the name of truth, are ye fantastical, or that indeed which outwardly ye show? My noble partner, you greet with present grace and great prediction of noble having and of royal hope, that he seems wrapped with all. To me you speak not. If you can look into the seeds of time and say which grain will grow and which will not, speak then to me who neither beg nor fear your favours nor your hate. Hail! 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 Lesser than Macbeth and greater, not so happy yet much happier. Thou shalt get kings, though thou be none, so all hail Macbeth and Banquo. Banquo and Macbeth, all hail. Stay, you imperfect speakers. Tell me more. By Sinnel's death, I know I am Thane of Glamis. But how of Cawdor? The Thane of Cawdor lives, a prosperous gentleman. And to be king stands not within the prospect of belief, no more than to be Cawdor. Say, from whence you owe this strange intelligence? Or why upon this blasted heath you stop our way with such prophetic greeting? Speak, I charge you. Witches vanish. <laughs> The earth hath bubbles as the water has, and these are of them. Whither are they vanished? 
into the air, and what seemed corporal melted as breath into the wind. Would they had stayed? Were such things here as we do speak about, or have we eaten on the insane route that takes the reason prisoner? Your children shall be kings. You shall be king. And Thane of Cordor too, when it is not so. To the selfsame tune and words, who's here? Enter Ross and Angus. The king hath happily received Macbeth, the news of thy success, and when he reads thy personal venture in the rebels' fight, his wonders and his praises do contend, which should be thine or his. Silence with that, and viewing o'er the rest o'er the selfsame day, he finds thee in the stout Norwegian ranks. Nothing afeard of what thyself didst make, strange images of death, as thick as hail came post with post, and every one did bear thy praises in his kingdom's great defence, and poured them down before him. We are sent to give thee from our royal master's thanks, only to herald thee into his sight, not pay thee. And for an earnest of a greater honour, he bade me from him call thee Thane of Cordor, in which addition hail, most worthy Thane, for it is thine. What? Can the devil speak true? The Thane of Cordor lives. Why do you dress me in borrowed robes? Who was the Thane lives yet? under heavy judgment bears that life which he deserves to lose. Whether he was combined with those of Norway, or did line the rebel with hidden help advantage, or that with help he laboured in his country's rack, I know not. But treason's capital, confessed and proved, have overthrown him. Glamis and Thane of Cordor, the greatest, is behind. Thank you for your pains. Do you not hope your children shall be kings? When those that gave the Thane of Cordor to me promised no less to them. That, trusted home, might yet enkindle you unto the crown beside the Thane of Cordor. But tis strange, and oftentimes to win us to our harm, the instruments of darkness tell us truths, win us with honest trifles, to betrays in deepest consequence. A word, I pray. Banquo, Ross and Angus move to one side. Two truths are told, as happy prologues to the swelling act of the imperial theme. I thank you, gentlemen. Cannot be ill, cannot be good. If ill, why why hath it given me earnest of success, commencing in a truth? I am Thane of Cordor. If good, why do I yield to that suggestion whose horrid image doth unfix my hair and make my seated heart knock at my ribs against the use of nature? Present fears are less than horrible imaginings. My thought, whose murder yet is but fantastical, shakes so my single state of man that function is smothered in surmise and nothing is but what is not. Look how our partner's wrapped. If chance will have me king, why chance may crown me without my stir. New honours come upon him like our strange garments cleave not to their mould but with the air uh, with the aid of use come what come may time in the hour runs through the roughest day worthy macbeth we stay upon your leisure give me your favour my dull brain was wrought with things forgotten kind gentlemen your pains are registered where every day i turn to leaf to read them let us towards the king Think upon what hath chanced, and at more time the interim having weighed it, let us speak our free hearts each to other. Very gladly. Till then, enough. Come, friends. Exeunt. So let's analyse some key lines in this speech. So in the first line, So fair and foul a day I have not seen, links directly to the witches in Act 1, Scene 1, who say... Fair is foul and foul is fair. The fact that these are Macbeth's very first lines in the play shows that he might be under the spell or influence of the witches already. So let's look at this line guys. So withered and so wild in their attire. So here Banquo is commenting on the appearance of the witches conforming to the look Jacobians thought witches would have. So next we have the line, you should be women, and yet your beards forbid me to interpret that you are so. So again this comments on the appearance of the witches, being unpleasant, 
and conforming to the expectations of a Jacobian witch. So the confusion over gender due to the witches having beards shows that Banquo is wary of them and their unnatural appearance. Therefore, he instinctively mistrusts them. As women were not allowed to act on stage during the Jacobian era, men would have to play these roles. So their manly features in female costumes and makeup would have been visually strange to its original audience. And this alone would instantly create dislike and even hate for these characters based entirely on their appearance. So now let's look at a modern translation for Banquo's lines. So how far is it supposed to be to Fores? What are these creatures? They are so withered looking and crazily dressed. They don't look like they belong on this planet, but I see them standing here on Earth. Are you alive? Can you answer questions? You seem to understand me because each of you have put a gruesome finger to your skinny lips. You look like women, but your beards keep me from believing that you really are. So what I want you to do guys is to design a set for Macbeth, detailing the stage and props needed for when Macbeth meets the witches. So you can either attach a picture or photograph to the form, or if you would rather explain it in words, detail a description of your stage. If you're drawing a set guys, can you please label it? Can you please make sure to read back through Act 1, Scene 3 to see how you could stage or position the characters? Please ensure your work is saved and emailed to your English teacher where possible. If you are writing on paper, please keep these safely stored for when you return to school.